It's a pleasure to be on and I hope to be able to tell you a little bit about what I think we know and what we need to learn with respect to uh, the effects of magnetic fields and magnetic electric fields. So what I have to do is provide some theory and some experiments that provide a basis for the mechanism from going from the physics through the chemistry to the biology that can lead to health effects. Some understanding of how weak magnetic and radio frequency electromagnetic fields can change the concentrations of radicals, reactive oxygen, nitrogen, and these in turn can cause health effects. Secondly, or third, I should say, more importantly in many respects, is that there not, we have modeled the feedback and repair processes to help explain why we see both positive and negative results and other times see no changes in things like cancer growth rates. And I think it's important that you be able to describe why you don't see things as well as why you do. And then I'll finish by adding some speculations on the possible implications of a long-term low-level exposure to RF fields. So background on this is there's been a debate for a very long time on the possible health effects of low levels of uh, RF fields. And that goes back, if there's anything, that more than 50 years, and the question is based on it, does it create a temperature rise more than one degree? Second piece of background is the philosophical approach in the United States has been to set standards so that they let the technology develop useful applications by studying the standards uh, below the lowest level proven to be dangerous. And the word proven is important there, plus some safety factor. And it's different for say designing bridges than it is for RF or it is for a given drug. And then if we were to require the technology to be safe against all those things we haven't thought of, we simply wouldn't introduce it. So that's part of a background in terms of looking at this program problem from an overall perspective. All right, so here's a limited, very limited summary of some of the standards. First, the standards at low frequencies are set on a basis of an electric field that's large enough to fire a nerve cell and the number in the IEEE standards is approximately five kilovolts per meter for frequencies left in less than 368 hertz. For RF exposures, the limits that are set on the basis of heating, and typically that's specified in terms of specific absorption rate, or SAR, of one watt per kilogram over one gram at 900 megahertz. And there are arguments about whether things should be over one gram or over 10 grams, and what the numbers should be, but this is roughly one of the more conservative parts of the current standards. And then, since you can't always measure that because it changes as you age, you change your position, et cetera, the far field exposures are set at one milliwatt per centimeter squared for six minutes in the range from 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz, and they've got functions of frequency and so forth at other, other levels but that's a simplified version of the current standards. Now, the current standards do not address the possibility of the biological or possible health effects from long-term low-level exposures to electric and magnetic fields. And this is for good reason. One of which includes a difficulty in getting reproducible results, a lack of mechanism from going from the physics through the chemistry to the biological changes that lead to health effects. Now this part of things is changing now, but these standards were basically set back in 1995, and this was pretty well where things were at that stage of the game. All right, now the reason I got involved in looking at some of these issues has to do with some following experiments. First of all, in my lab we showed that we could change the growth rate of fibrosarcoma cells, HT1080 cells, and pancreatic cells uh, with magnetic, by canceling out the Earth's magnetic field and going to fields that are less than 18 microtesla. Secondly, we showed a decrease, if I look at the study on National Toxicology Study of 1999, and I'm interested, you wound up seeing small decreases in the cancer incidence in mice and rats for exposures that they were looking at. And they properly concluded that was not evidence for increasing the average cancer rate. And then we've seen also in 
and in Olsman's paper, an increase in the growth rate of cancer cells with RF frequencies, a 50% increase in, and also changes in the hydrogen peroxide concentrations. And we'll talk more about that as we go along. Now, additional experiments that are part of the background for me is changes in measured free radical concentrations and looking at the interphone study where you had both some increases and decreases depending on the reported exposure levels. And we'll talk about that more, but on the average you wound up with the conclusions after many years of argument as to what to put in their report that on the average they did not have uh, data that led to changing standards. All right, now the hypothesis I'll put forward is that we can change concentration of free radicals, meaning OH minus, OH, uh, or I mean O2 minus, OH minus, and hydrogen peroxide and calcium, which are not radicals with magnetic fields. These molecules are both molecules that can be used in signaling biological systems to do things we want them to do, but they can also do damage to lipid proteins and DNA. And third, there are feedback and repair processes, so we do not see damage most of the time. So that's a hypothesis that I'm working from. Now, I need to define what I mean by a free radical. Free radical means that I have an unpaired electron spin. That makes these atoms very, uh, very active. And they can recombine rapidly with other, other protons, other molecules rather, because nature likes to wind up with these things evenly paired up on that. Now, the magnetic field couples to a magnetic moment of the electrons and can change both the energy and the angular momentum. And conservation of the angular momentum leads to one of the major reasons why we think changes in uh, radical recombination rates. I'll take one brief minute and talk a little bit about the effect of static magnetic fields. And this is for a deuterium molecule, which is very much simpler many other things. And what you see on the graph on the left is that as I increase the magnetic field, the spacing between the energy levels and this molecule change as I increase the field. It means that I can shift any resonances by changing the static magnetic field. And when these lines cross, I couple energies together. Or when I wind up applying, as I was in the green lines here, a frequency which is, corresponds to the distance between those two energy levels, I can couple one, one, the particles in one energy level to the particles in the next energy level. And the diagram on the right shows that we have to take into account the nuclear spins as well, but I won't go into that because we don't have that kind of time. All right, now what this leads to, when I look at radical pairs, if you look at the left, I have a series of energy levels that deal with uh, nitric oxide. And on the right, I've postulated some energy levels. When these two energy levels line up, essentially where the red line F equals three halves corresponds to the M equals minus one half in the J three halves level, I get rapid recombination. If I shift as I have in the slide in B1, so that these two energy levels do not line up, then I wind up with a barrier for uh, recombination, and that in turn leads to if I have split a molecule in part with, say, optical energy or thermal energy or chemical energy, to an increased probability that I have an additional radical pair. So you can think of this a bit as you've got two electrons that are coupled slightly differently to the uh, in each of the two fragments of this radical pair to their nuclei and they're circulating at different rates. And when they lined up parallel, they're not allowed to recombine by the Pauli exclusion principle. When they're lined up oppositely, they recombine rapidly. We won't go into that farther. All right, but that does some theoretical background as to why we can see changes in concentration of radicals when we change the static magnetic field, or if we couple those energy levels in one of the two radical parts of a radical pair, 
we can also change the recombination rate. So what's been observed is in an exposure at seven megahertz at 10 microtesla right, root mean square for three days in a DC magnetic field of 45 microtesla leads to a change, a 45% decrease in O2 minus and a 50% increase in hydrogen peroxide. And it's also seen in these same experiments was an enhancement of the cellular perforation up to say 40% in two days and 45% in three days. So we have a way when we're changing magnetic fields or changing exposure to an RF field of changing the growth rate of these cancer cells. Okay, now hydrogen peroxide is a, a one we've looked at and it's a normal part of the metabolic process. It's both a signaling molecule and it can be destructive uh, and, uh, as well. And it's a bit like your grandmother told you, at low levels, it's a good thing or, or not a good thing in this case, stimulates a, the growth rate of cancer cells, but at a high level, it kills them. So, but reactive oxygen and hydrogen peroxide are a normal part of the cell's metabolic processes. And we see as many as 20,000 uh, radical pairs per cell per day created. Now, we do, we use that and it's a normal part of what's going on. And for example, when you exercise, you increase the amount of radicals in the and reactive oxygen species. And you can increase this concentration by 10 to 15 times, but then it relaxes back to the baseline. However, the problems occur if you wind up keeping that elevated levels for a long period of time, and then you reset the baseline. And this is when this is associated with things like aging, cancer, and Alzheimer's. All right, next question is, why don't we see effects most of the time? The feedback and repair passes are part of a normal way of living. None of us would be alive today if we didn't have them. When you cut your finger, you don't bleed to death. All right, when we generate excess reactive oxygen, it also triggers the generation of additional antioxidants. But there's a time delay for the generation of these antioxidants and the reduction of the hydrogen peroxide. So I've got a feedback loop with a time delay. All right, there are many kinds of biological amplifiers. So we're talking about using the magnetic or electric fields as a signaling mechanism and the metabolic energy supplies the energy to drive the amplifier. There are more than 3000 signaling proteins in biological systems and more than 15 second measures. Most of these biological amplifiers are contain negative feedback to stabilize the system. However, because of the time delay, if we provide a periodic signal, the system and the system has gain, it depends on the timing of the, of the signal with respect to the natural, say oscillation frequency or gain of the system. So an increase in hydrogen peroxide leads to an increase in the antioxidant, which leads to a decrease in the reduction. Now I can get either amplification or attenuation with this and think of this in terms of, of pushing a swing. If you push the swing at the peak, you wind up accelerating it. If you push it at the bottom, you wind up stopping it. We have the same thing going on with respect to timing in any of the oscillating systems inside the biological system. And one we've been looking at particularly has to do with hydrogen peroxide. Okay, now here's some experiments of one of my former students, Cindy Bingham, back in 1996. And what she showed is she changed the amplitude at 60 hertz. She could increase the growth rate of mastocytoma cells up by a factor of three to four, but she changed the amplitude by a small amount and she wound up cutting the growth rate by over 50%. Now, at the time Cindy did this work, we had not one clue as to what was going on. But if you take some of the things that people do and you take the average of that, you can say on the average, she didn't see anything. And I, my favorite cartoon with respect to that is this guy with a block of ice on his head standing in a bucket of hot water. On the average, he's at the right temperature. 
So it doesn't tell us what we want to know necessarily. All right. Observed changes, nitrogen peroxide and growth rates, HD 1080 cells, fiber sarcoma cells. Again, quoting the work on that is, an exposure at 10 microtesla, 5 to 10 and 10 megahertz at right angles showed an static magnetic field of 45 microtesla for eight hours increased hydrogen peroxide production by 55%. The reduction of cell count by 30% on day two. And these changes are time dependent. So you have to worry about exactly how you do the experiments if you're gonna get reproducible results. And you've got to control the static magnetic fields, which many biologists don't realize is a variable. And you have to control all the biological variables as well. So it's time dependent, and this is an important factor. All right, let's switch topics for a moment and say, well, what people are worried about base station exposures, and this is an experiment out of India, which shows people living at 80 meters from a base station are, and on the average, exposed to higher levels of uh, radio frequencies than those living 300 meters away. And on data analysis, on the exposed group, and this is a small sample, so you've got to be careful about it, shows that the is an increase in the micronuclei for the people living within uh, 80 meters compared to those living 300 meters. And the analysis, because they were able to draw blood on this, shows a significant attrition, uh, attrition in gladiatome, I can't pronounce things right, catalase and superoxide uh, is or SOD, and a rise in, in lipid pre-oxidation. So you're getting changes then in the background of antioxidant concentrations. So since I'm running out of time, very briefly, standards currently are set on the basis of short-term and heating for RF. Low levels of magnetic field can lead both increases and decreases in the concentration of radicals. The effects of are a function of frequency, the angle between the AC and DC, which we haven't talked about, amplitudes and pulse repetition rates, and the biological effects of these things are expected to be a function of time, depend on other stresses. This is Tony. I just want to give you a heads up that uh, we're close to time out here and want to change over when you're ready. Said he showed no overall elevation. We're out of time. <laughs> okay. Anyway, well, uh, to, just I'm... to finish. Anyway, you do get some implications out of this, and we'll we'll cut off and we'll pick that up later if we have time.